And welcome back to the Visual Studio 2013 launch edition of Channel 9 Live. I'm Brian Keller. Once again, I'm joined with my good friend and colleague, Aaron Bjork. I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself again, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about this, this uh, fresh yeah. face. So it's good to be here again. <laughs> I think we were just doing this, but I'm Aaron yeah. Bjork. I'm a PM lead uh, working on Visual Studio and Team Foundation Server and Visual Studio Online. Great. My name is Greg Boer. I'm a program manager also. work on the, all the agile planning tools, work item tracking stuff. And, in Team Foundation Server. That's great. Well, let's uh, actually catch up on a little bit of our backlog of questions, because since you left us this morning, and we've actually had a lot more questions related to Visual Studio Online. Sure. And uh, the first question is, how do you actually migrate? So let's say somebody is doing you know, on-premises development with Team Foundation Server today, and they want to move to the cloud. Or maybe you want to move back later, because you realize the cloud's not for you. What's our story there? Yeah, so uh, you're going to start me off with one of those. It's, it's on our backlog questions, because yes, uh, we'd, <laughs> we'd love to have a, a, a better import story. Uh, but we do have sort of what we call like tip migration. Obviously, you can take your source directly there. You can take work items and um, using our Excel integration, import mm -hmm. them directly into uh, the service and do things like that. And then we're working on uh, both import and export um, um, items as well. So those are both on our backlog. We hope to have a great export experience actually in the next few months. Okay, great. So. And I, I also know um, a third party called Ops Hub uh, today released that they, they have integration between Visual Studio Online and on-premises Team Foundation Server, yep. right? I don't yep. know if there's anything else to add uh, to One that. of our gold partners, check them out. They do a bunch of great stuff in the integration space. Fantastic, so. fantastic. Now, now, Greg, one of the things that we saw in the, in the keynote this morning was this new capability called portfolio management. Mm -hmm. um, what is portfolio management? How does it build on what we've kind of been using from Team Foundation Server, Agile planning in the past? How, how, sh how should we think about this capability? Sure, yeah. So the way I look at it is in uh, the prior release, we created some good tools for the team to use. Like a team could have their backlog, a team could plan their sprint, a team could use a task board to manage the work. Like a uh, scrum team would, right? Exactly, yeah. right? And so, and really what we wanted to provide tools for teams to be autonomous and, and manage their work. But what we didn't have and what we're adding in 2013 is the ability to have visibility above the team. So imagine you have several of these really efficient scrum teams working. Um, how are they work contributing to a common goal, for example? So we provide a way for you to map the work on a team to a common set of goals, and then you can see, hey, I have this goal, which teams are working with it, what's the progress on it, and so forth. Um, I would say our goal is like teams can continue to work the way they work, they can continue to be autonomous, uh, and then we still get that without sacrificing the visibility up. Right, and so one of the things that um, that I think I found is really important for people to understand is that when you're taking advantage of this portfolio view, you need to have everybody working in the same team project, mm -hmm. right? That's what, right? What's your guidance you would give to teams as they start to embrace this model? I would say just exactly that. That's what we do. We have uh, we're a very large organization, um, and we have all of our stuff in one team project, which allows us to have this traceability going up. Um, there are ways to make it work if you're in multiple projects, because we know there are customers that have that. Um, but the best solution is to have everything in one team project for your work item tracking. And then you, you create multiple teams, right? Yes. And those teams get mapped to uh, an individual area path for work items. Exactly. And, and, and on the source control side, I imagine you can permission them for a particular for sure. branch. Yeah. Te teams are the way to do it. You have a team project. You can break it up into teams. Teams get their own backlog. There's actually a security group assigned to a team, which you can then use to do secure other areas of TFS, sure. like source and so forth. So. OK, and, and um, one of the things that we showed in the keynote this morning is how even though you're kind of putting everybody into the same team project, you can still customize parts of what you're mm -hmm. doing. What, what, what are my options there? Sure. So like the, with the teams, um, it's their hub. We want to make it their collaborative hub. So you get a team room by default with mm -hmm. a team. You have a home page of which you can uh, customize and add charts to that home page, which are interesting to the team. You can customize uh, what your Kanban board looks like, for example. So each team has control over their Kanban board. Um, the way Kanban works is that it's, uh, you know, you, you define what your flow is going to be, and, and that's very personal to the team. So every team can define what, what columns appear on their Kanban board, but they still get roll-up across the teams as well. Um, a couple of other things would be like tagging. We have lightweight tagging with work items where anybody can just add a tag to a work item and then filter by that tag, and eventually we're going to be adding querying on those tags as well. All right, that's great. And so, um, uh, so querying, so the ability for you to go into other views outside of the backlog view and still understand exactly. how those how those tags work. Mm -hmm. What about the ability for me to report on things like the the substates that you're creating within Kanban? And that's another one I get I get asked about a lot. Yeah, that's a very good question. Right now we have these um, when you 
create a column on a board, um, you map that to a state. So it sort of becomes a substate uh, um, for, that, for that specific team. We are working to add the ability to query on that column as well and also view it on the form. It's not there today, um, but we know people want that. It's an important field to them, so we're going to add that functionality as well. Okay. Here's a great question from Pat. Any plans to provide us with a way for splitting a product backlog item, or I suppose it could be a, a requirement or you know, really any work item type, into smaller ones when you realize it's too big to be managed by a single team? What, what would you tell teams to do there? Yeah, I don't think uh, it's a great question and it's a common scenario. Um, it's something that I would, we, we put these into some, sometimes these categories, and this is one of those things that I think we'd love to go do. We're just trying to take care of some of the other things first. Mm -hmm. So we call these uh, small rocks, and they're things that we're trying to find ways we can squeeze them in. It's definitely a, a candidate item. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I imagine if you wanted to track work that was being done across multiple teams, you could always do that at the feature level, Correct. right? Yeah, absolutely. And then allow the teams to roll up to that. I think that. that's one of the benefits of the, um, you know, we were talking about the portfolio backlogs, is you get a, a coarser grained backlog, essentially, and then you can break that coarser grained backlog into um, appropriate level, whether you're using user stories, PBIs, requirements, we don't care. Mm -hmm. And um, at, the, at the finer grain level, then teams can uh, sort of, you know, manage the work as, as they see fit, but you still get that roll up up to this, this coarser grained item. And out of the box in all of our templates, we included a work item type called feature. Mm -hmm. um, and that allows you to do that sort of out of the box. Uh, for on-premises, you can customize that. You can add additional layers. Uh, internally, we have four layers, for example, on our internal um, team foundation server. So we've got scenario at the highest level, then we break those down into experiences, then user stories and tasks. Great. And so that actually, what you just said, plays really well into a question John's asking. So are feature work items available in all team projects? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, all team projects and all templates. And so, so, so if you're upgrading from 2012, where we didn't have the notion of feature, what's your experience look like there? Yeah, if you want to do that, then you can go ahead and run an enablement, uh, which will add feature to an existing team project. Or if you create a new team project, you'll get, uh, of course, the feature work item in the new team project as well. Okay, great. So uh, Raj is asking a question here about migration. So I don't know if you guys can help us with this one, but um, he's asking what the story would be for migrating from TFS 2010 over to 2013. And I wonder if he really means migration or upgrade here. Yeah, so upgrade, I would just say, it, not a problem. You just mm -hmm. do it. Um, so we've worked really hard at upgrade to make sure that it's um, sort of non-destructive, non-disruptive, and, uh, and it's going to work. And, and, and it will, you know, so I think you can go ahead and do the upgrade. Uh, if we're talking about migration, uh, a lot of times people ask questions about migrating between process templates. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we don't have um, sort of turnkey solutions for. We've got partners that help in that space. Uh, you can certainly crack open the work items and do some of the modifications yourself. Sure. Uh, but you can migrate uh, work as, around that way as well. So. Yeah, one of, the, one of the things I always try to recommend to, to customers as they start to customize the process template in the, in the world of the on-premises Team Foundation server is treat that like any other software project, right? Document it, make sure you're versioning everything, checking that in, because you never know, it, Microsoft could come out with some new process template in the future, and you need to go back and be able to replay your changes on top of that, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right, yeah. And w one of the things, I guess, just building on that too, that we've worked really hard at for the last few releases is making sure that a lot of this new you know agile functionality whether it's backlogs or Kanban right. boards or tags or whatnot it just works when you upgrade um, we've got uh, Greg alluded to it sort of this enablement wizard where you can go through and do the appropriate mappings but you're not having to go through any of these um, sort of difficult steps or migration steps to turn that stuff on. It's just there for you. And, That's great. And we want it to continue to work just yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, so, Greg, here's a question for you. Uh, Method Maven is asking, what improvements have been made to Kanban? I guess the, the follow-up question would be, since when? Sure. Because there's yeah. always new changes right. happening. But bring us through kind of the history of Kanban. With you, sure. With I mean, when we first released Kanban, it was based off the state model of the work items. Um, there wasn't much opportunity to change the columns if you wanted it. Um, what we've uh, done since then, we've, we've allowed you to now, uh, every team gets their own Kanban board, basically. And, and then they map to a state model. So they get both the autonomy of the team, yet they still roll up to a common state model. The things that we uh, are, so that's where I brought you up to speed today. Mm -hmm. What we'd like to do, the, the big things we want to do in the future, what customers want is horizontal swim lanes. So I want an expedite lane, and then I want my normal work lane, possibly, that we're working uh, to add as well. And then also being able to take the columns that we have and splitting them into a, a doing done sub-column, which means like, okay, I'm actively working in this column. I'm done with this column. It's ready to go to the next one. 
but they don't have the capacity yet, so it's just kind of hanging out there. So those are the two big things that we're looking to add soon, as well as being able to query on this new field that we've added. Great. Yeah, some great. people call those like a queued column as well. Yeah. And then another queued. thing that, that mm -hmm. Greg didn't mention is we have um, WIP limits or yeah. work in process limits for each of those columns. So mm -hmm. for each column that you define, you can set uh, a numeric value for you know, how many items do you want to let into this column before we uh, sort of visually flag it for you. And we don't stop you, you know, if you have, a, you have it set to five and you move six things in there, we're gonna let you move the sixth thing. But we right. turn the column red and we sort of highlight for yeah. you that you're, you're probably creating a flow problem for yourself yeah. at this point. And that's the whole point of Kanban, is to visually be able to see that stuff. Right, there's a couple of analogies I, I like, to, I like to, to use with customers, which is if I gave you three basketballs and asked you to shoot those into the hoop, you wouldn't just try to grab all three and push them up there. Yeah. Take one at a time, right? And combines yeah. the same way about limiting that flow. That's good. I'm right. going to use that. Yeah, yeah. go yeah. for it. Yeah. Go for yeah. it. I stole it from my friend Jeff Wilson, uh, so credit yeah. to him. Thanks, Jeff. I yeah. right. appreciate that. Uh, so Mike Billington, he's, he's saying, are there any limitations to adding your own work item types, uh, difficulties with upgrades and that sort of thing? So I, I, I have to imagine he's asking about the on-premises version of Team Foundation Server. Mm -hmm. Um, well, here, here's one that I get, actually, which is what if somebody to 2012 had added a feature work item type? Mm -hmm. not, not too crazy to think that that may have happened. What happens when, when our upgrade enablement tries to do the same thing? Yeah, so, um, so, uh, so the end result is, is we've made all of our Agile tooling, the Agile portfolio management, the Agile planning tooling, can be configured to work with any process template. We actually, internally, we had that exact issue is that we had... Uh, scenario experience and story work items already existed before we before we added the new features to our internal server and you can go back and wire them up so if they have a feature work item they can go back and 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 modify the settings to wire up uh, the what we look the feature backlog to their feature work item and then there it's all there for them so that is possible um, now that we have this, as Brian mentioned, as uh, Aaron mentioned, we have this configure, which will automatically configure your features for you. Um, that is, a, that will work if it recognizes your process template as one that we've shipped and it's close enough. Then we will do the work for you. If it if it doesn't, it says, look, we can't do this, and it points you to an article to do it yourself. It's not hard. It's some XML that you need to import, and and you just basically say, these are the work items that represent features, and we take it from there. Great. Great, good to know. Uh, well, I guess it wouldn't be a TFS launch without this question. Uh, Johnson's asking, can we upgrade from Visual Source Safe? Which, uh, which of course, we have uh, shipped converters for Visual Source Safe for several years, so that's available um, in the box with TFS, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So we can help you upgrade there. Mm -hmm. um, so Jamie is asking this question. It's a, it's kind of a follow-on to what we were asking earlier, sure. um, Aaron. So any plans to expose the the APIs within the Team Web Access so that customizations can be made uh, to that experience? Experience or to consume the data from TFS, maybe within Visual Studio Online. So, what are what are my extensibility options today? Yeah, so I think w let's start with the data. And like I said earlier, we're we're working on um, REST APIs essentially that'll allow you to, to interact with that data. We're working on OData feeds and things like that. So we're starting there. Um, extensibility within the web framework itself. Um, you know, we're doing some little bits and pieces there. Um, I don't think I have anything to share in terms of a big plan there yet, but uh, it's something we hear from customers a lot, and we're listening, um, but we don't have any announcements to make about sort of the web extensibility yet. Okay, but uh, but today, if I wanted to interact with the data that's on the web, I can, or the data that's in TFS, whether that's on Visual Studio Online or TFS, I can use the TFS object model. Yep. We've got OData support. Yep. Um, We've got OData support, up. which you know well. Yes, yep, yes, that's right. yes. So. It's a shameless plug there for yep. a project I got to work on. <laughs> um, so here's an easy question for you, Greg. Pat is asking, Will it be possible to show the new charts in the project's homepage? And the answer is yes. In fact, last Friday we released that on the service, the hosted service, um, so that functionality is there. You can go to a query, create a chart, pin it to your homepage, and it shows there. It's not in the on premise product that we just are launching today, but with, in, with the next update, it will be there. That's so, great. Yeah. And I can also, what, what, what else can I do with those charts? I, I can create my own dashboard that's available on the web. Mm -hmm. I can easily copy and paste and email those as a daily summary. Mm -hmm. anything, yeah, those charts else? are, you can, you can take them all. You, uh, any, if you've seen any of the demos, like you can choose any kind of visualizations that you want. Essentially, it's a two step process. What's the data? And it's just simply uh, building a query to get your data, and then you decide how I want to visualize it and pivot it, like what Nicole was demoing earlier this morning. And then you can just pin it to your homepage.
page, and, and you can send links to them. Yeah, it's quite shareable. That's great. I, I love the customizations you can do to the home page. Mm -hmm. It's looking really nice these days. Um, so, uh, so Bart is asking a question, which, uh, which we may need 45 minutes more to talk about. But, um, but is there a quick answer to this one? What is the best way to manage multiple releases for multiple semi and non-related projects, which are all maintained by the same team? Yeah, uh, let's see. Bart, my Twitter, Twitter handle is uh, at Aaron Bjork. Uh, get in touch with me, and we should take probably take yeah, that one sure. offline. I don't think I can answer that in yeah. here. Probably uh, at least that. one place to start would be the branching and merging guidance sure. that's out sure. there on yeah. CodePlex. Sure. But yeah, I, I can imagine there's a. I've had half day conversations with the that's customers sure. about there's this all aspects. one. There's plenty of work one. aspect. Yeah. There's the managing your code aspect of it. It's pretty, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I'm serious. Bart, get in touch with me and we can talk off them. In I'll 140 to. characters or less. That's back right. And forth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. So Dan is asking here, uh, when you add those custom swim lanes to, uh, to a Kanban column, mm -hmm. um, can you tie the burn down metrics to any of those swim lanes? So for example, done would be the third column and the fourth column would be a test regression column, uh, complete column be able to report on those individual substates at all? So when, you can, we, when we add the substates is the question? Uh, uh, sure. With, with the existing substates. With the existing okay. states, we, what we have is we have an existing uh, CFD chart, a uh, cumulative flow diagram chart right. that is based on the columns that you have. So the, the, the major columns or the sub-columns? The, the sub when you it say sub-columns, I'm referring to the, the team Kanban columns that yeah. they pick. Customized, the CFD yeah. chart is based off of that already. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so you'll see when you go add those columns, you actually see new um, sort of layers appear mm -hmm. in, your, uh, in your CFD yeah. from the point in time in which you added them. That's right. Okay. And we're actually, we've got some things on the backlog there, some small improvements with mm -hmm. the CFD. We're going to give you configurable dates on the CFD. That's right, that's coming like soon. That. So mm -hmm. you'll start to see some of that stuff trickle out on Visual Studio Online. Great. So, so speaking of your backlog, Aaron, this question is going to haunt you until you implement this, I know. <laughs> Can you integrate an on-premises Team Foundation server implementation with SharePoint Online? Yeah, so th the answer is no. Right okay. Now. Yeah, we don't have any out of the box support for that. Got so. it, got it. This is called Aaron's job security. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, any plans to expose or expand on the Kanban WIT extension? Uh, I'm not sure what's. what's yeah, how I, I can speak okay. to that. So, um, I, I wrote a, uh, an article online called Kanban Under the Hood. You could probably uh, bing it and find it. Um, okay. So, yes, we are expanding on that. We're looking at ways to allow customers to add custom fields using that new model. So that if I want to create a new field, I can just add it so that I'm not modifying the core process that everyone else is using. I'm really adding a field for myself, which is going to allow us in the future to do things like upgrade your process from mm -hmm. release to release. So yes, we, are act we built that thing as a way to, re to modernize our platform to take us into the future. Great. Sure. Great. That sounds really uh, high tech. <laughs> <laughs> um, into the future and beyond. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so Troy's asking here. Um, actually, I, I'm surprised we didn't get this question earlier. Any new changes to uh, to requirements management within TFS 2013? Yeah, there's nothing I, I don't think really new in, in, in 2013 with, mm -hmm. with regards to requirements management. Um, we've got some great partners that fill this space and we continue to rely on them. Uh, we've got our storyboarding tool, which is a great sort of lightweight way to document sure. requirements. And I think the portfolio backlogs, while it's not requirements management, it does sort of give you a coarser grained um, view of the backlog that you know I think starts to trickle into the requirements management space a bit. So okay. yeah, I'd, I'd check that out for sure. Yeah, and certainly when we think of partners, there's a lot of great ones out there. EDEV is probably the one that I see the most traction around, and they actually just released a new version of their tooling, which builds on top of Team Foundation Server. So they've got some really light, lightweight, agile yep. ways of managing your requirements, whether that's in Word or Visio, and, and uh, really just building mm -hmm. kind of that office suite right on top of TFS, which is really, really nice. Um, so, so Aaron, I know you've done some talks in the past about how our internal teams adopt um, adopt our own you know, dog food, our own sure. technologies, sure. right? So, um, for people that haven't seen these presentations, and you can go watch them on the events tab of Channel Nine, are there any key takeaways you've learned as we kind of adopt these toolings ourselves? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll just give you a couple of just thoughts that come to mind. Yeah, for those that that maybe aren't familiar, we. We work on a three-week cadence. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about how we update the service every three weeks, and that essentially mat matches our sprint schedule, or sure. our execution schedule. Uh, for this release for 2013, we actually had our entire division working on a three-week cadence, so that was something new. A mm -hmm. um, couple of key learnings, I think, for me is one, um, have one sprint cadence, you know, align your sprint boundaries. I talked to a lot of teams that, uh, and we actually looked at how to do this in the tooling. You know, well, what if I've got one team that's doing four-week sprints and one week that's doing two-week sprints, and it, it really leads to chaos. I think you need sure. sort of one schedule to rule them all. Uh, we do have teams that actually take a three-week sprint and break that down into a bunch of one-week sprints. 
but we think in terms of a three-week cadence. So when I say sprint 33, we all know what we're talking about. Exactly, right. Yeah. right. You don't want to have to be, is that sprint 33, you know, dot two, right. or is that my <laughs> sprint 33? And yeah. uh, it's funny because we are in the midst of sprint 57. That's our sprint. We've just numbered ours, and mm. we started with, I, I can still remember sprint one. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't very successful, but we've been <laughs> learning as we go. Um, another key thing I think that we've learned is that we never stop sprinting. So we used to uh, break our bigger schedule down into sprints, and then we'd you know sprint for four or five sprints, and then we'd take a break, and mm -hmm. we'd have this stabilization, stabilization phase. phase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Greg's actually written some great articles on this, but um, it doesn't do anything good. All we ended up with was uh, a lot of bug debt. Uh, when we went and talked to team members, they actually tell us just stop doing that. Like right. just let us manage our bug debt and let us keep sprinting. So. We just continually run on this three-week cadence now forever. And um, I, I don't know when we would ever break from that. But I think it's been really, really helpful for yeah. us. So, um, uh, so I, I, I love what you guys um, have done to your workspace, like your physical workspace. Uh, for those of you that haven't visited the Microsoft campus, if you ever come by, uh, Building 18 is where sure. most of yeah. your team works. Yeah, look us you, up. You're in these shared team rooms now. It seems yeah. like a really great place, a great environment to work. I, I have to ask, I've walked by. I've seen you guys using the task boards to actually track mm -hmm. your work. Work, but when you're in these physical team rooms, do you still use the, the new team room capability to actually communicate with one another, or is that kind of redundant? Yeah, I think it depends team to team. team. Some, yeah. some teams are actually, they, they keep it up as like a feed. Every one of the team rooms that we have, they're done very nicely actually, have a big screen, 100 inch screen TV. Mm. And sometimes they'll just leave the team room chat up on that screen. Um, and it's just kind of rolling by and stuff, and it becomes a way of just sharing stuff, and it, and it works well. It's a culture thing. Um, some team, some team, team rooms, teams. It's a, uh, everyone decides what they want to do. Don't do it so much. But certainly, like you'll see task boards on these on these walls, Kanban boards on these on these big screens as well. It's been a nice move. I, I've yeah. really, really enjoyed moving to the team room environment. Nice. Yeah. One nice. thing I'll say too about our our team room uh, feature in the product too is that. It's so much more than just chat. Like a lot of people look at it and just go, it's just a chat room. And it's not. It's really sort of a durable um, archive of activity. Mm -hmm. So when you're making changes to work items, you know, they show up there. When you're checking something in, when builds are failing. And so it becomes this running log of what's going on in the team. And what I find is that uh, teams go to it to kind of catch up. You know, even if you stepped out for a day or a couple mm -hmm. hours, you know, you pop back in and you see what's happened. And that leads to all the the good conversations and the right conversations. And whether you're in then a physical team room or a virtual team room, uh, you can have the conversation. But I, I found it very useful. Got it. That's great. So uh, so one parting question here. John's asking, what's the future of reporting in TFS? Yeah, yeah I, I would just say it's going to get better. Okay. So uh, we, are, <laughs> we, have, uh, we, we know that uh, we haven't sort of turned the dial much in reporting in past releases. Uh, you're seeing us really just get started with that, with the lightweight charting stuff that we're doing in 2013, and I think just hang on because we're gonna we're gonna start doing a lot more. Here. I think we so. could say that you know one of our goals is that it's gonna be super simple to create the mo most charts. Mm. Just like you pick the data, yeah. pick a visualization, you pin it, you're done. You don't have to think about you don't even have to think about reporting. It's just that fluid. And then we're gonna provide a a, a, a powerful way to still get the data that you know do all the kinds of pivoting and everything that you want to do that will still be available also. That's but, great. I yeah. mean I mean that's that's certainly true because there's so much value by having this integrated system within mm -hmm. ALM. The easier we can make it to get those insights right back out of the system, right. the better for that's everyone. Right. Um, so Greg, Aaron, thanks for being on the show. I know you guys uh, we know you've got a long backlog, so I'm <laughs> not going to hold you back from it. You can go uh, get back to work and uh, in just a few minutes we'll be back on Channel 9 Live with Robert Green talking to the Windows 8.1 development team. We'll see you right here. Thank mm -hmm. you.